Welcome in to another Inside Carolina postgame podcast sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com, and Congruity, congruityhr.com, front slash char heroes for all your needs for your small and mid-sized business. I am Tommy Ashley. That is Taylor Vipless. Greg Barnes joins us tonight. So I put myself at the bottom, put the two experts at the top. North Carolina cruises past Notre Dame. I entitled this one, Pure Joy in the Smith Center. There's some pictures out there that just show the joy in these players. Taylor, I'll come to you first. Uh, You can't ask for more. For the seniors to get their day for the walk-ons to start the game, for the walk-ons to finish the game. Um, Just a a fantastic night in the Smith Center. The last for Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan, and then a lot of question marks for next year. But let's talk about this evening, 34-point win, 33-point win for Carolina. Yeah, when when Armando Baycott is shooting the ball like Steph Curry, it, it, it doesn't get much better for this North Carolina basketball team. I think my biggest takeaway watching this game was just the reminder of, of of how fun that this group has been, and especially in comparison to to some of the years past for this North Carolina team. And as as you enter the postseason, that was kind of my biggest takeaway of being like, you you have Armando Baycott for for one last ride. This could be R.J. Davis's last year kind of just enjoy this team, enjoy this group, and kind of putting into context what they're doing this season. They enter the year with one first-place vote for first place in the ACC, and now you're going into the Duke game with a chance to to win the ACC outright in your biggest game against your rival. That that was my biggest takeaway. My my second biggest takeaway, and I, I hate to give free ads, free promotions, but I have to give it up for for crumble cookies because their promotion with with the two missed free throws when Notre Dame missed back to back free throws that was as loud as I've ever heard the Dean Dome and it was what a, a 35 point game at the time with all the walk ons in so uh yeah about as perfect a night as this could have been you muted he's muted Am I muted now? Not no, anymore. Now you're good. No wonder. I thought I was going to have to filibuster for hey, a while. Hey, Tommy, hang, hang on one second. Hold on a second. It is literally the. Uh, All right. I just had to enjoy that for just a moment. I uh, see. I've got this thing covered up because it's red underneath. So I can't tell when it's muted or not. And it's hot right now. I'm going to start <laughs> over. I felt bad for the Notre Dame young man. Because he is a walk-on, I believe, or he's one of those guys deep in the bench. And he's the one that has to shoot the free throws with the place going nuts. Um, and Crumble Cookies, it, it, they lost a lot of money tonight if students will show up on that. Greg, you've covered a lot of these senior nights. And a lot have gone well. A lot have gone bad. I don't think any of them have gone as good as this one. I mean, it was perfect for North Carolina. It really was, and and Taylor kind of hit on a key point for me is uh, the neatest thing about one of the neatest things about North Carolina basketball is the senior day um, history and the tradition of allowing the the senior walk ons to start. What I think is kind of lost in that sometimes is that you want to be able to beat down an opponent so they get more time at the end because. Uh, I hope everybody watched the last four or five minutes of that game because, uh, Taylor, to your point, but they were having a blast, um, everybody. And for the you know, Armando to come out with you know, three and a half, four minutes to play, and then RJ, and for them to to get their just due in terms of fan response and standing ovations, and then for the walk-ons to come in, who have just given so much to the program for, for so long, to be able to play for not 20 seconds but for several minutes in front of a cheering crowd, uh, just phenomenal. And that's really what North Carolina basketball is about. And look, coming into this game, I know Notre Dame have been playing better, uh, but this we're talking about better. We're talking about one of the worst power six teams to uh, a little bit below average. When you look at the last month, they've been playing equivalent to about NC State. So whatever you think of NC State, that's kind of what we're looking at tonight. Um, but North Carolina uh, – this is a game that probably should have won by 15 or 20 when you look at kind of the metrics and those kind of things. 
North Carolina looked like a number one seed tonight. And they came out and they made sure that they were going to take care of business quickly. They kept the foot on the pedal. And they made sure that the last 10 minutes of that game was just a party. And that's really what we saw. And and that's what made that such a fun night. Yeah, Carolina wins 84-51. I think they got up by 30 with 15 minutes or, or 13 or 15 minutes left. And just sort of cruise from there, let them come back a little bit, and then just went off. Let's let's talk about that first half play, Taylor, because it really reminded me, especially the way Harrison Ingram was playing. It reminded me of Duke in the Smith Center a couple weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, I guess. You know, when North Carolina has all of them clicking, Cormac hitting some shots, Ingram hitting some shots, um, Cadeau's just doing his thing. To Greg's point, this is a number one seeded team, and they play defense tonight. Um, and got after Notre Dame. Just from the, we'll talk about the first half because to Greg's point, second half a little bit of a party. But in that first half, has Carolina played a better uh, stretch of ball there after it was eighteen to sixteen? I mean, they have, but I haven't seen it recently for sure. Yeah, the the only game I would kind of put on par with it is, is the Duke game, just because of the level of opponent and, and the moment in that Duke game. I think Elliot Cadeau has gotten better and better offensively as as the years gone on, and uh, his ability to to finish in traffic and, and make these acrobatic shots through contact is really impressive. And I, I think what was even more impressive for me than than Carolina jumping out to such a big lead in the first half was Carolina starting the second half on an 11-0 run and. You know, they had their foot on, on Notre Dame's neck. They go into the break and they come out and essentially put the game away within the first two, three minutes. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Greg, Greg hit it where when when this North Carolina team is at their best, you know, you could put their best with with UConn's best, um, with Kentucky's best, with with Purdue's best. There there really isn't a team that that this team, when everything is rolling, can't hang with or, or can't beat. Yeah, and like people are saying in the chat, we talked about when you have your center position, have four threes on the night, you know you're shooting it well. And Carolina had that when I believe Washington had a couple, Baycott had a couple. Greg, let's sort of look at Cadeau um, because I really think he's the difference. And we've talked about it, Taylor and I have talked about it, but I wanted to get your thoughts here. I think he's the difference between truly elite and 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 truly good or, or borderline great and his play just managing the game but not only managing the game getting to the rim when he wants to I, I think that's the difference in the way this team play is playing now and versus the way they played um, in the first part of the year November and December he has really come into his own and part of the pure joy comment that I made on the beginning is him go find the pictures and I can the, the thumbnail for this is just he is having so much fun where I don't know if he was having a great time early because he was still trying to figure it out. Well, he's figured it out, Greg, and he's a true difference maker on this team. Yeah, there's no doubt. And you can – here's the thing with, with most college players, especially guys that are underclassmen and freshmen, is very rarely do they have their the perfect game. Uh, very rarely are they ready to go pro and they don't have anything to work on. But it's very difficult to find those kids who understand what their limitations are and can hide their weaknesses and then maximize their strengths. I think Cano does that about as well as anybody I can remember. Uh, I know people think he needs to shoot better. I guarantee you he knows he needs to shoot better. But he's not going to automatically do that Saturday night. You know, that's going to be a work in progress through the offseason to become a more consistent outside threat. So while he does need to take some of those shots when they come to him, he understands what he can do offensively. Uh, he controls the game like a veteran point guard. Uh, he, he makes some really good smart passes. Uh, he's able to help move the ball. That's really been a struggle for this team. You know, as R.J. Davis and Caleb Love were, were trying to figure out, okay, who's the point guard, who's the two guard, or both combos. There's no doubt that Elliot Cadeau is the point guard of this team. And there's a lot of value just in that statement. 
and he knows how to run a team. I mean, he's, he's gotten better defensively, a, a lot better defensively. He was kind of a liability early in the year. Uh, he's, he's battling now. He's moving his feet better. And so I, I agree with you. I thought it was very interesting that, that Jim Beheim, who, regardless of what you may think about him, he's a Hall of Fame coach, and he's, he's won a lot of games over the years. And I think he's very insightful. I, I found it somewhat enjoyable listening to him uh, as an analyst this season. But he made the point that, well, you know RJ and Armando are going to give you what they give you pretty much every night. You know Cadeau is just that solid presence there. And to say that about a freshman – from Jimmy Bayham says a lot. And his point continuing on was like, so you got those three guys, and if you add Cormac in and he has a good game, then you add Harrison Ingram in and he has a good game, look out. Uh, which kind of gets back to Taylor's comment a minute ago. Uh, but I think Cadeau has just really kind of become an anchor for this team. Um, he's he's allowed RJ to really thrive in that off-guard position. And that's, that's critically important for this team uh, moving into the postseason. Well, yeah, you cannot overstate how important guards are, especially this time of year. It is a guards game. I don't care if you've got a 7-4 center that's dominant all year long. You will go home early if your guards don't play well. And I'm not talking about any particular team in the Big Ten that wears black and gold. We were all thinking it. Uh, you know, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if <laughs> I don't know who you, what y'all are talking about, but I'm just saying, if your guards don't play well, you're going home. Um, Taylor's been a little chippy, folks. We were waiting for Greg to join us. Taylor, Taylor's all in on this stuff. Um, but let me get you in here on on the combination because I want to save two for last. But but Taylor, the combination of Ingram and Cormac, the two transfers that have just been ridiculous for this team. Harrison Ingram, another double double. I think he had ten double doubles this year. What do you have in his Stanford career? Like six. I mean, he's just been great for this team, but he plays with an intensity and Cormac Ryan's off the charts intensity level. And Cormac hit some shots tonight, Taylor, four for nine, 14 points. Those yeah, guys. And, and now, and I talked too long, but now going into the Duke game, those guys were the difference makers in the first Duke game. And now they're going to Cameron carrying it forward. Yeah. With the additions of Cormac Ryan and, and Harrison Ingram, I mentioned it earlier, like, this North Carolina team had one first place vote to to win the ACC this year, and that's why I, I think it's it's a clear and obvious choice that Hubert Davis should be the the coach of the year for the ACC, and not only for how this team has performed, but how he constructed this roster. Where you you really from a team that missed the tournament had a bunch of transfers out, and the only major contributors coming back were R.J. Davis and. Armando Baycott, and he went out in the transfer portal. He had to hit the portal heavy. He identified Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram as, as potential starters. And not only have they come in and and been great basketball players for this team, but they've been the the vocal leaders. They've been the guys who are bringing the toughness. They're the guys that are bringing the the energy and intensity. It, it's been a point that I've said a lot this time, a lot this season, where it's like if. When you throw all the pieces of this North Carolina team together, the way they fit so effortlessly, I, I think the coaches deserve a lot of credit for that. And, and the transfers deserve a lot of credit for that because you're taking a bunch of players from a bunch of different roles. Harrison Ingram was not on a winner at Stanford. Cormac Ryan was not on a winner at Notre Dame. Jalen Withers was not on a winner at Louisville. And now all these guys are coming together and, and putting the pieces together to be a top 10 team for 85 90 percent of this season I, I i don't think you could say enough good things for for how well this team ha, has come together and, and how well the pieces have fit yeah and hubert davis said the other day in the media availability i can't remember if it was last week or the week before and he said when you're getting people greg when you're getting people in regardless of whether it's transfer or a high school player or whatever you want to get to know them as much as possible but you never truly know until they get here and I think to Taylor's point there, it's a it's a credit to Hubert Davis for for a getting them, b getting guys that fit, but also to Cormac and to Harrison and to Jalen Withers and Pax and Wojcik to to a little bit lesser extent because he doesn't play it as much, but to be all in on the way this team needed them to be, and and there's plenty of season left, 
but it's just been fascinating for me to watch how those guys have really blended in and, and made it so much better from the inside out for North Carolina. Yeah, you know, Roy Williams always used to say, you would rather have talent than experience, but preferably you could have experienced talent. It's kind of the, the idea. Uh, and what Hubert Davis did this, this off season, he knew he had to get uh, somebody in that could play the four that was athletic, like what he wanted. Harrison Ingram has done that. He needed to get, get somebody who could come in and play on the wing and hit some shots. Cormac Ryan has done that. And I think Cormac uh, has had his best defensive season of his career. Um, he was not known as a defensive guy at Notre Dame. Uh, Mike Bray really didn't coach defense. And so Cormac has embraced that. Uh, but in terms of the experience, one of the things I think is interesting, um, North Carolina, if you look at kind of their, their level of experience, when you look at Ken Palm, uh, average D1 experience, 3.2 years in terms of people playing. That's fifth nationally out of 362 teams. Uh, Micah Shrewsbury is going a different route. He's bringing them in young and wanting to coach them up. Because of that, Notre Dame uh, is at 357th nationally in D1 experience. And you can see that on the court tonight. Um, Notre Dame has potential. I think Shrewsbury is a good coach. I, th I think he's going to get them probably better better than what Mike Bray had them if he's given time. But they just rely on so much youth and inexperience. Uh, and you know, Carolina, with the experience they have, playing you know, guys who have played at, at the Power 6 level for a long, long time, uh, yeah, they may have a bad game shooting. But like Cormac Ryan's done this year, he didn't just vanish like a lot of underclassmen have done, right? He's he's fought and he's played good defense and he's gone after rebounds and he's made up for some of the what he couldn't provide scoring the ball. Harrison Ingram does everything. I think he's learned through his first two years at Stanford of hey, you know, to be able to help a team win, I've got to do as much as I can in every phase of the game. And so by getting guys that have come from programs with, with quality coaches like a Mike Bray and a Jared Haas, guys that you know. Um, you can kind of put together a roster that will give you a lot of success. Now, there's not a lot of NBA talent on this team. I think we all know that. But the amount of experience on this squad um, is going to help tremendously as we get into the postseason. And that's really been a joy to watch as this group has come together this year. Yeah, I want to I want to talk about my sponsors here for a second, but I want to look at the stats for a second. I don't know if I've ever seen this. I, maybe – R.J. Davis, and I don't really care about the plus minus, but R.J. was plus 43 tonight. <laughs> You're going to have me running out there with him. I don't know, really. <laughs> I mean, the only people that were not were, as you expect, um, Harrison Ingram was plus 23, Baycott plus 37, plus 43. People that do these stats, if you're listening, find out some the highest somebody's ever been a plus minus. Um, you know, I'm sure it's out there, but I can't remember ever seeing one. Let me talk about Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. They're on Franklin Street. If you're coming to Chapel Hill for the Duke game, I realize it's in Durham, but if you're coming to hang out in Chapel Hill, go buy Johnny T-Shirt and pick up some of the swag there. They've got everything you need, all the basketball related. They've got some NIL stuff. They've got baseball jerseys, and they got all the different stuff you need. If you need a magnet, if you need a sticker, shot glass, beer glass, just cup. They have everything at Johnny T-Shirt. If you can't get there, get to them online. Also, congruityhr.com front slash Tar Heels. <clears throat> Go get your small to mid-sized business assessment. They can hook you up with all you need to grow your business into a national brand like they've done with Congruity. National guys pay the bills right fast. And then we're coming back. And we're staying here on the YouTube, but we're coming back and talking about the last two guys I want to talk about. All Tommy, right. can I start? Can We're I start back. you with Taylor. a stat? Yes, start us off. It's uh, the second half. I need you to bring the heat. The game okay. was close in the first half, but we need a we need a fast start. So everybody knows this is senior day. I, I almost had a double and triple check this stat. When Armando Baycott made his collegiate debut for UNC, Patrick Mahomes had zero Super Bowls. He's won three since. <laughs> I had hair. <laughs> no, I didn't actually. 
I remember talking to Baycott in the bowels of the Atlantis, and I've mentioned this before. After that Oregon game, his, I guess, what, his third or fourth game of his Carolina career. And that was in 2019. And Baycott just played his 160th, 161st, 62nd game. Let's talk about him. Taylor, I mean, we've given him a hard time for missing bunnies. We've we've done this and that. But the fact of the matter is he's brought it as, as much as he can physically bring it every single game he's been out there. He did it again, again tonight. Didn't have his best game ever, but the two threes <laughs> – that's ridiculous. Let's be, let's call it what it is. That's ridiculous. And they didn't touch anything but the net, Taylor. Just sort of speak to Baycott over the last four and a half years heading into yeah. Duke. Yeah, he, he stepped into that one with some confidence too. When yeah. when you look at a player's career and like totality in, in the collegiate level, I, I don't know if you, you're going to find somebody with a, a stranger career than Armando Baycott where his first season – COVID shuts it down. That was not a tournament team by by any stretch of the imagination. Fast forward a couple of years, they go to a, a Final Four run. They lose in the national championship, but you end Coach K's career in Duke or at Duke. Then you end Coach K's career just coaching in general, beating him in the Final Four and getting the chance to play and beat Duke in the Final Four in New Orleans. Then the next year, everybody's talking about redemption. They're they're on the Sports Illustrated cover. That team misses the tournament entirely. And Armando comes back this year with NIL and, and everything that kind of surrounds college basketball. And he's the preseason All-ACC player of the year. And e- even though R.J. Davis has kind of taken over a- as the, the first option, Armando Baycott still plays such a huge role on this North Carolina team. And Hubert Davis has said it a bunch too, where it's like he, Baycott started to concede like this is RJ Davis' team. And Hubert Davis was kind of like, I, I never said this was this was anybody's team. We need you to go out there and be the guy. So I think when when you look at what Baycott has gone through, the ups and downs, just to get to this point where North Carolina is hovering on the one line for for at the very least, the the two line going into the last game of the season against Duke and into the ACC tournament. I, I think it's, it's crazy to see what he's been able to accomplish in, in four and a half years and all the numbers that he's kind of put up and done in Chapel Hill has kind of spoken for itself. Yeah. I mean, you got a guy that comes in with his buddy, Cole Anthony, high expectations. It doesn't go as, as it was planned, but Hubert's talked about this and this is one thing he sticks it out, especially in this portal area. Um, he sticks it out and, and has done what he's been able to do. Greg, I'm going to flip it and let you talk about R.J. Davis because this is a guy, he's got a year, he can come back if he wants. Um, but speaking of taking over a team, I mean, six foot on a good day, um, can shoot at all three levels, can get to the rim with ease, can pull hit the pull up. He defends better than he did. We talked about Cadeau. I think that's important. RJ has gotten to be a better defender. Um, just sort of, I mean, you've done it for a long time. Just put sort of RJ in, in context as, as this ride this year winds down. Yeah, well, I think the, the thing with, with RJ is that he's he's a much better perimeter shooter this year than he has been at any point in his career. Um, he can kind of, you know, hit, uh, create his own shot, uh, pull up behind the arc and knock him down. He can also, you know, hit down, hit, hit spot up threes. And because of that ability, it's opened up, uh, uh, penetration lanes for him. And he's done a really good job with that. So he can score, uh, anywhere on the court and he's a gritty kid. Uh, he likes the competition and I think the fact that he's not battling with with another guy like a Caleb Love, and Caleb, of course, is a front runner for you know, uh, Pac-12 Player of the Year honors. So same could be said for him. But because they're not competing as much in the backcourt, uh, and you've got a guy like Elliot Cadeau who's like, all right, this is this is you. I'm just going to help. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to help you. Um, it has allowed him to flourish. And he's the type of player that you know, as you watch him throughout the course of his career. 
Uh, just think about the the challenges that that he had and Caleb Love had and and all these young guys had coming in that freshman year, where you don't get the the team camaraderie, you don't get all the fans in the Smith Center, um, you don't get the off season workouts that you're accustomed to getting. You know, as a young kid come into a, a major program like North Carolina, and so those guys were stunted early, and RJ was no different, and so you don't have a great first year and you kind of hear some criticism coming out for no fault of your own. Um, and so it's just really kind of been this building process and he got so close and had such a, a really good season two years ago. Last season was, you know, kind of up and down and for him to really take over this year. Uh, I mean, we're, we're not even to the regular season finale. And I mean, if he's not unanimous ACC player of the year, I don't know what we're doing here. Um, I just think he's, he's been phenomenal. He's, he's a great leader. And, and the, the thing about him in terms of making a decision to come back, I think Armando Baycott really kind of laid the framework of saying, you know, I could go, I could not go. I really enjoy college. Now we have NIL where I can actually make some pretty good money. So I don't feel like I have to go chase the dollars at the next level. So RJ has that ability at the same time. I don't see RJ possibly being much better than he is right now next year. I think that's just an incredibly tough ask. He's going to be a first team All America. Um, you know, Kendall Marshall went when when he was hot, when he had a good end of the year run back in 2012. Uh, you know, if RJ is ever going to take a chance, this would be the year to do it. But of course, that's something he's going to wait until after the the season comes to the conclusion to make that decision. But you know, if he wants to go, hey, he he's earned that right. He's he's been just a fantastic player for for the Tar Heels. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Duke before we get out of here. It's been the post game podcast a little longer than normal. Shout out to the seven hundred and fifty six people that have been in the chat. Um, want to give you the good stuff here. And Taylor, Greg, and I don't get to talk much about basketball, so we're sticking around a little bit longer. Taylor, Duke trip to Durham. Uh, I've been over there, covered it. Did, did you ever get your tickets for Saturday, Taylor? No. I've been. If anybody, can, a, if anybody can help that out, if anybody could Venmo me, my Venmo <laughs> name is just at Taylor Vipolis. I'll put everything towards <laughs> towards a Duke ticket. <laughs> Somebody probably do it. Uh, it. It is a people can say what they want. Greg, you can speak to it too. It, it is loud. It is stuffy. They are right on top of you. Um, my advice to young reporters is always speaking of crumble cookies, take the cookies to those cats and get them off your back. If you feed them cookies, they'll form a wall around you. Um, but Amanda Baycott's done this. RJ Davis has done it. Cormac Ryan's done this. Harrison Ingram, to my knowledge, has never played in there, at least not in this rivalry. And Elliot Cadeau playing over there. Is it a big deal? PNC's more angry. Duke's louder and hotter and more suffocating. Your thoughts on this matchup coming ahead? Because it, it's going to be for the outright ACC championship for North Carolina. That's you, Taylor. Oh, I, th I thought you were tossing that to Greg. Uh, I zoned out for a second. Um, wow, well, yeah. I, I didn't talk that much. <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, yeah. This is such a such a great experience for this team. And just to, to win the ACC outright where you don't have to, to share the title and you have guys who you have both sides of the coin where one, Armando Baycott, RJ Davis have the biggest win for North Carolina in that building probably. And then you have guys like Ellie Cadeau, like Cormac Ryan, like Harrison Ingram who are newish to the rivalry, but they have experience beating this Duke team. And I think I think what you saw in the the first matchup is that this North Carolina team matches up pretty well against this Duke team. And if this Duke team's not hitting their outside shots, that a lot of the matchups and a lot of the the size favor this North Carolina team, where Duke doesn't have that interior player like a like a lively last year that that the the normal type of guys that give Armando Baycott a little trouble. And, and with the way R.J. Davis is playing, with the way Armando Baycott's playing, with Elliot Cadell being able to kind of get to the basket at will, 
I, I think there are a lot of things that that favor this North Carolina team and going into Cameron, it, it, it just matters. And, and you could tell that it matters to this team, especially with, with all the experience they're bringing. And it's like, if if there's one person like I I don't want to bet against, it's somebody like R.J. Davis who has proven that he is a bucket. He can he can go out and, and get you 25 plus points with with relative ease. And if if there's one thing he can do, it, it's score the basketball. And there there's just a lot of things that I think favor North Carolina going into this matchup. The only thing that's really kind of going against them is is Duke's home court advantage and. Just, just the worry of once you're in an environment like that, letting it kind of take over you and, and and pressing. But overall, the ability to go into a, a game and and sweep the matchup against Duke. And I actually, I just got the notification: Kyle Filipowski questionable soreness for for Saturday. We'll we'll see if he plays. Do not put that out there in the ether. You're gonna have people going nuts. <laughs> Um, he will play. <laughs> Don't I'm not going there. I, I'm not. I had so, a good. I had a good comment, and I totally forgot it when you threw that out there. Go the ahead, um. Go ahead. So here's the thing about playing in Cameron. Cormac Ryan has played at Cameron. He hasn't played in a Carolina Duke game. Uh, it, it is different. It, you know, if you've been to a Carolina game, a Smith Center game, against uh, Syracuse. And then you've been the one against Duke, it's different. And that's what these young players are going to see on Saturday night. Um, having somebody like RJ and having somebody like Armando, who, Taylor, I think you're exactly right. I, I think uh, winning on Coach K's final home game night was the biggest Carolina win in Cameron, at least certainly in my lifetime. Uh, and so to have two guys you can kind of rally around and lean on to kind of help you is critically important. But the thing has always been at Cameron, that place is, is going to be so wild and crazy and loud and stinky. And, you know, if you're a young reporter, take several bottles of water from the press room to press row with you and put them at your feet. Why? Inevitably, somebody's going to get dehydrated and fall on top of you. Of you. They're going to be leaning against your back, and you're going to be wondering what they're doing, and they're smelling, they've got sparkles on you. you got to push them back, and you give them water. And they'll say, oh, thank you, thank you. And they will protect you. That's, that's, that's just how this – every every time, this is how it works. Cookies but and you, water. <laughs> but you have to withstand those opening five to ten minutes. And if you can do that, if you can get to the ten-minute mark of the first half – relatively close, you know, three, five point game, you're fine. You're in it. You're used to it. The place will still be wild and crazy, but it's down a notch. And that's really all the, all it takes. Um, here's the issue I think for Carolina, when you look at barttorvik.com, you can really kind of go back through the metrics and you can set any type of parameters that you want. If you go back to February 1st, uh, Connecticut has been the best team in the country since that time. Arizona is number two. Duke is number three. Duke has really turned it on of late. Uh, I know not having Foster is going to hurt, uh, but they really are playing solid basketball. And so if North Carolina plays Saturday night like they did tonight, uh, they certainly have a chance and they can win that game. But they got to bring it like they did tonight. Uh, and I think that was good for them tonight to be able to win that. Um, that's all I've got on Duke. Anything else on Duke before I ask you an all-ACC question, Tommy? No, I, I remembered my quote before Taylor I, threw me off with that um, that um, faux injury report. I'm going to quote Mike Krzyzewski, if anybody watched the Rivals thing with him and Roy Williams. What did he say when he walked out there? If the referees don't screw it up, probably be a pretty good one, something about that. That's what I want to see. I want to see the best five on the court throughout the night and let them go at it. And that's the only ask I have whenever this game comes around. Go ahead, Greg, with your LACC. So anybody who watched the game on TV, you probably saw this late in the broadcast. Uh, and I was a little surprised by it, but I wanted to run it past you guys and get your opinion on it. But you had West Durham and Corey Alexander and Jim Beheim calling the game. They submitted, you kind of pregame, what they thought the LACC team would be. 
they had four unanimous picks. R.J. Davis, of course, P.J. Hall, Reese Beekman, who's probably going to be ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Okay. And then Hunter Salas from Wake Forest, which, okay. So what that leaves you with is you've got Kyle Filipowski from Duke, and you've got Armando Baycott from Carolina uh, as kind of the, the top of the line of guys who are battling for that fifth spot uh, in, in what they're suggesting kind of should be the case. So do you agree with that? And do you think do you think a guy like Hunter Solis or even Reese Beekman deserves to be on the first team all ACC ahead of Armando or ahead of Filipowski? Taylor, I'll Tommy? let you go. I think I, I, it, if Baycott's not first team all ACC, it, it's criminal, especially if Carolina beats Duke on Saturday. I, I mean, in my opinion, he leads the ACC in rebounding. You're on the best team. Uh, R.J. Davis is a lock. If he's not, if he's not consensus unanimous, whatever they call it, then somebody needs their voting rights taken. Period. Yeah. Um, but I think Baycott's got to be on there. I'm not sure I like the Salas pick, even though he's good. I do like P.J. Hall, um, but the the number one team in the conference. When you have guys that are leading the respective uh, rankings, categories, and whatever, they got to be on it. Period. Now, Filipowski's probably going to be on it. I would, I would probably bet any of those guys on the on the call that Filipowski's on it, no matter what happens Saturday. But Taylor, what do you think? Yeah, it's. I I think I I don't know how the 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 mindset of of the voters kind of, kind of goes, but my thought process is that it would go to Filipowski just because if, if Carolina wins the ACC outright on Saturday, you you have one person from the first place team and you have at least one person from the second place team instead of stacking all the players from one team. But it, it, it's hard to look past the numbers that Armando Baycott is, is averaging. He's the only player in the ACC averaging a double-double this season. And, and when you're, you're, when you're kind of looking at the, the numbers from some of the people – it's hard to make an argument for for anybody um, over Baycott and what they meant to their team this season. And I, I do have to respect when when they were debating that. Greg, Jim Beheim was like Judah Mintz, just because Judah Mintz is, <laughs> is a Syracuse exactly. guy. <laughs> well, I mean, he's right about Mintz, but here, but I don't. I think the first place team, when you have two dominant players, I'll say it again, needs to get two. Duke's gotten two before. Carolina's gotten two before. I don't think somebody that's a middle of the road ACC team needs to have a guy on there. And wait, what's Wait for us doing tonight? Getting they're attacked down, again? Are they? As of right now, they're down fourteen well, to yeah. so Georgia Tech at home with one twenty left. You go Baycott. You go R.J. Davis Player of the Year. Baycott, Filipowski, P.J. Hall, and then you pick one. I don't think Beekman needs to be on there at all. I mean, it's easy to play defense, kind of like Army. It's kind of like Jay Bateman at Army having a great defense. You know, if the other team doesn't Jay, get the Jay ball. Jay Bateman's but... watching this post-game podcast right now. Like, how did I just catch a shot? I know. He just, he just took shots in the post-Carolina Notre Dame podcast. But it's the same point. Anyway, Greg, get us out of here. You said you had a random comment, and then I'm breaking out of here. The funny thing about Jay Bateman is actually he came up in conversation. I was at uh, – a college visit at Elon this weekend. Of course, he was the defensive coordinator at Elon a decade plus ago. And so ran into one of his former players and Jay Bateman made an appearance there too. Um, that was not the random comment I was going to make, although that's probably more random than I was going to say. Um, I wanted to talk about metrics for a minute. Uh, do either of you believe that with Carolina winning by 33, that Hubert Davis was trying to run up the score tonight? I'm not a I'm not a big metrics person, so I, I I almost don't even understand how to kind of game the system when when it comes to metrics. Um, but yeah, that that was one of the things I was noticing when there was like five minutes left, and it's like a a thirty point game, and then you know it's still that margin, and it gets to like three thirty. I'm like, hey, 
take take the starters out. Tommy, yeah, I don't, I don't. I mean, if you were trying to run up the score, you do what Shashevsky used to do and run them all the way up. I mean, you had Lebo and those guys out there, and look, those guys can play. You take those guys and put them on a random court with us, and they'd kick our butts. But it looked like random court with us on it at the end. So to to my belief is I don't think they was running up the score at all. Correct, and I absolutely agree. I do not think there was any thought whatsoever about, hey, let's run up the score because we can. Um, and I think this is an important part with the, the metric conversation because I think some people just believe, oh, well, teams are just trying their best to run up the score. Carolina was favored to win or projected to win by 16 tonight. They doubled that. And it's not because they were trying to run up the score. It's because they were a much better team than Notre Dame tonight. That's how this is supposed to work. Really good teams, elite teams, take care of business, and they overpower weaker teams. And that's exactly what we saw tonight. We saw a team tonight in North Carolina who that team, if they show up every night, no doubt that's the number one seed in the tournament. That's how UConn's looked most of the year. That's how Purdue's looked most of the year. Houston's looked that way most of the year. Arizona has occasionally. Um, and I think that's what kind of gets lost in the conversation about, oh, we're the game in the metrics. Um, I think this is a good example. I, I don't, I'd be shocked if Hubert Davis, knowing who he is, would ever say, oh, we're just going to run up the score because we need to. That's just not part of who he is. But he's also not going to apologize for being a much better team on a given night than his opponent. And that's what these metrics are trying to decide of, all right, when a team has a really good night, how much better are they than their competition? Uh, and then you're going to have your B game nights and your C game nights, and you're essentially averaging all that together is how it kind of comes together. And that gets us to where we are. So I just thought that was kind of a, a unique look when you start looking at you know, North Carolina kind of doubled what their projection was. So this is a game that's really going to help Carolina and the, and the metrics help them shoot up a little bit. Yeah, which is ridiculous. Um, these metrics have gotten out of hand, but. Whatever it's happened to the all eye test. Yeah, really. It's a fraud. Um, it's a fraud. Yeah, don't believe your eyes, Taylor. I mean, the worst the worst evidence in a case, in a criminal case, is eyewitness testimony. I mean, it just <laughs> is. All right, boys, I'm getting out of here. We've been on here for 43 minutes, it looks like, and 770 people still in here. That's why Inside Carolina is the best place to be for everything. Let me run down what you got coming up this week. It's tonight, Tuesday. You got this. If you joined us late... Pick it up on the podcast feeds or on the YouTube channel. Tomorrow, Noon Dish with Don Callahan. That's always an interesting one. Sean Crawley's already hyping it up in there. And also, hit the like button on these YouTube videos. I think our one the other night had 300, 400 likes. Uh, we need more than that. Hit the like button before you get out of here. And then look forward to rafters. Right, Taylor? Yep. We got a rafters this week. We got a shooting it straight this week. Somebody's been mentioning... Theo and Justin Jackson on Run Your Race. If y'all, if you guys hadn't listened to it, go listen to that. They they spin a lot on uh, Duke Carolina rivalry. It's a pretty interesting discussion with those guys. And then of course North Carolina post game after Duke. We'll probably have a probably have a group on that one too as well. We'll see how the game goes and see how long we'll be there. Um, but it's another great week at Inside Carolina for everything. And then we have On the Beat Live at nine o'clock Thursday night as well with Jeremiah and Adam and Evan doing the work right now. Greg, Taylor, appreciate it, fellas.